Okay, very good. I think um, we can start now. Um, see the attendee list has um, has filled up. Yeah, thanks again for for joining the webinar. I'm I'm really happy that you joined this webinar. It's the second of our series here, um, which we started due to let's say the situation uh, around the world. So I sh sure hope that um, you and your family are safe. You're probably in the same situation like me. I'm sitting in my home office, and um, we thought it's a good way. Uh, to share knowledge yeah, instead of going to events and uh, explaining things or um, even one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, I think this is a good uh, possibility to share knowledge and also to, to learn knowledge. Um, so <clears throat> uh, we started this webinar on this uh, topic. Uh, is very broad. Cellular IoT explains everything about 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G and uh, LTM and narrowband IoT. So I, I guess for each of these topics, actually, you could make a separate webinar, but we want, just wanted to provide a rough overview for people who are new to cellular connectivity and who are maybe evaluating to buy a modem for cellular connectivity to connect their devices or who are just about to change uh, their current modem to to a new technology and um, now let's say evaluating which technology is the right one. Um, the last webinar was about the 10 most um, used cellular connectivity features. Uh, it was a very good uh, webinar with very good feedback. Uh, the recording is um, available on demand uh, so, you, so you can watch it um, as well. Okay, so with that, I, I will give it a start. Um, you can find, you can always um, ask questions. I will uh, address them at the end of the call. Um, there is a questions um, menu in the go to uh, webinar uh, where you can just um, ask questions and I will address them later on. Very good. So, um, so this is the agenda. Uh, first of all, I noticed that a lot of the attendees um, seem to be new to Emnify. Um, so I will give a short introduction about Emnify. Uh, and then I will um, directly dive into the background of mobile cellular networks, um, explain a little bit uh, the differences in uh, uh, multiplexing, uh, different uh, qualities of the different radio types, on the coverage, uh, power consumption costs, and then I will have, let's say, two or three slides uh, each for um, uh, the low power uh, technologies, LTM and narrowband, as well as 5G, um, which is coming up and um, is uh, definitely in everybody's mouth. But uh, if you are developing an IoT solution, you obviously want to understand uh, what is available now and is this something that I already need to consider when um, defining my next modem. Okay, so I hope we will have 10 minutes at least at the end of the session to, to answer questions. So, um, Emnify is a cellular connectivity provider. Uh, you may also say carrier. The um, the uh, thing that is um, unique for us is we are provide a cellular cloud platform. So we have uh, all our uh, network infrastructure in the cloud, which gives some specific benefits. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this today. Uh, this is a, a session, a different session, uh, which we'll have maybe in five weeks. Um, but overall, um, Emnify was founded in 2014, just at the, I would say, right uh, time when IoT has um, grown tremendously. Um, we have um, now 3 million SIM cards in, in, on our platform with over 1,000 uh, customers that are really distributed all around the world in 70 countries. Um, we are now I would say actually 110 employees, whereas 30% are in R&D. Um, so we are actually developing um, 
uh, further enhancing our solution. We're not just a plain MVNO uh, that is reselling some connectivity um, from, from an operator, but um, we have our own infrastructure, our own agreements with operators, and with that we uh, provide a special service to our customers. We um, are a German company, so um, the uh, development center is in Würzburg in Bavaria, and um, I'm located in Berlin in our headquarter, um, where where uh, let's say the other functions are. And we also have um, a support support organization in the Philippines um, that uh, ensures that we can offer a 24/7 um, support for our customers. So this is probably, uh, let's say, how Amnify is known. So we provide cellular connected connectivity anywhere in the world. So we are um, operator independent. Um, this means with our SIM cards, you can connect uh, in all the networks in the country, not just with one local carrier. Um, and uh, we uh, provide basically coverage in 800, uh, 180 countries. So uh, you don't need to think about when you, uh, let's say, ship your device, which SIM card you should uh, plug in. Um, it's it's really just one. But that's not all. Um, our SIM card is actually programmable. Yeah, So we, um, to manage the connectivity, we have a rich API. And based on this API, we also provide a management portal that allows you to manage everything about the connectivity, the contracts, uh, costs, limits. So all the features actually that I talked about um, last webinar, um, uh, which our customers are using to steer um, connectivity um, to, to better serve their customers. Um, here's just a, a short overview of our customers. You see it's really horizontal. We have customers in all the different verticals. Um, uh, we're not focused on consumer uh, businesses, but or we have some businesses that are serving consumers. Um, uh, our large customer base is really in B2B2B um, businesses where I believe that really IoT is taking place where um, IoT solution providers or um, they, um, manufacturers, they have a device and an application. And uh, with this, these devices, they offer to their customers as a service. And um, these may be even, those customers may be even um, offering a service themselves to a different business. Um, and uh, with that, there are some let's say certain requirements on the solutions uh, that need to be considered. And um, this is where we're strong at, uh, where, where our, let's say, large customer basis. Okay, but um, enough about Amnify. Let's go into, um, let's say, the promised comp content of the webinar. Um, cellular connectivity explained. So, um, just um, this is an introduction. So everyone who's let's say has been in this field for for more than two years should not listen to this webinar, I guess. Yeah. Um, although there may be some news on the 5G narrowband um, uh, things that are of course always uh, updating um, here, that that makes sense. Um, the the next webinar. Um, just as a highlight, is just about the top five best practices for cellular IoT device security. Uh, some features that basically cellular connectivity providers can offer to make your device more secure. So, what is relevant when choosing the radio type? Yeah. So, if you hear anything about LTE and 5G. Um, then uh, it's all about bandwidth, right? So uh, um, that with um, 5G, you are able to reach 10 gigabits of uh, downlink. Yeah, but is this really relevant for IoT? Yeah. So if you think about IoT, or if I think about IoT, I see 
85, 90% of the use cases that can be well served below a gigabit, a gigabit uh, of download speed, right? So um, you see here the evolu evolution of this download speed. And I would say many of the use cases can be even addressed with uh, GPRS, GSM. And this is also that we, what we see from our customers. And uh, besides downlink, um, uplink is, let's say, less, um, less promoted, but actually that's even more relevant for, for IoT because um, opposed to consumer handsets or smartphones, uh, the uplink path is where the device sends data, and this is what is really relevant for IoT. Uh, the, the data is sent from the device to the cloud application, and there's only few uh, amounts coming back to the device itself. Um, so what is relevant? Yeah, what is what should you look out for if you choose your um, cellular connectivity, um, which radio type you choose? So of course, uh, first thing is um, if you choose a connectivity type, does it work while I ship it? Yeah. So. And there are a couple of things uh, to consider um, that um, that I will discuss um, in in this uh, webinar. And uh, then it's about coverage. Yeah. So if you have a, a payment terminal or um, or a smart meter which is indoors or which has, let's say, um, um, stationary. Um, deployments, then you are obviously interested which technology will bring you me the best coverage, the best chance that my device gets connected so I can offer good service to my customers. Uh, something that is uh, very has become very relevant um, is uh, power consumption, modem size, and costs. So um, there has been other technologies like uh, LoRa and Sigfox that were, let's say, stealing some of the market share um, in in um, wireless connectivity from cellular connectivity. And there are, let's say, new advances like narrowband IoT and LTM have um, been initiated by the GSMA and um, the carriers. So. Um, to address these needs. But I also want to look into how does, let's say, also these factors compare to uh, G3, G and 4G. Yeah. And uh, last but not least, uh, if you choose the, the modem type or the radio type, you of course want to understand how future-proof is the solution. If I now choose um, LTM narrowband uh, modem, is this really um, the right choice or should I wait for 5G because then uh, there's something else coming out? So let me uh, just dive uh, in really quickly. Some background of, uh, or about um, cellular connectivity and the mobile network. Yeah, so I always start with uh, pointing to the nearest antenna if I need to un uh, explain someone what is cellular connectivity and how does it um, let's say play out and here this is actually a picture from my balcony um, where I have let's say direct sight to the antenna. Uh, unfortunately it does not seem to be from, from my operator because I don't have really good coverage inside or I'm too close to the antenna uh, but this is let's say what is visible for um, for people. Yeah, So this is where the um, the mobile device connects to. But actually what is happening after the antenna is um, there is a base station. And um, so I took uh, you know, a snapshot here from Google Maps exactly from, from this antenna. And uh, this is how it looks on the roof um, or, or of this uh, house. And here you actually have a base station, uh, a base station which um, let's say processes all the data that's coming over uh, the antenna and um, as well um, sends the data through the antenna down to the device. And then there are um, different components, um, uh, the home network. You know, so if you're, oh, this is actually a visitor network. Um, uh, I'm sorry, there is a typo here. Uh, core of the visited network, which is, let's say, if you're, um, you have a SIM card from a German operator, and you are you are in in the US, 
then your visited network would have some specific components that are used and your home network would be the one from uh, from the German operator. And here there is, let's say, uh, the, the differences in these technologies are pretty, let's say, not relevant in the, the core network. So I want to more concentrate on the radio access. But um, just first, um, let's say the different terminology. So uh, 2G um, also uh, referred to as GSM, 3G, UMTS, 4G LTE, and 5G, uh, maybe some people don't know, but 5G is basically um, new radio. Uh, so this is how it's coined. And um, on the antenna or on the multiplexing side, let's say it's not really the antenna, there are different concepts uh, that are used within these um, uh, within these technologies. And I'm actually going to talk about this in the next slide. Then you have the base stations. They let's say have similar functionality, uh, but have been evolved tremendously from 2G to 5G. So a lot of more intelligence is now within the base station itself, um, which reduces things like latency. Um, and um, yeah, these are just the names for the different components in case you run over them. Um, and um, then there is um, the, the visited network, um, components, really thick servers that are hosted by the operator um, on these huge server farms. And um, they, they have been evolving over, over, over the years, um, over the technologies. Um, a lot of combinations of the functionality, simplifying th things. Um, we have come from a non-IP uh, background, yeah, where um, everything was, let's say, time slotted and uh, different uh, transport now to an all IP um, network infrastructure. And uh, this is, let's say, the, the, the nodes on the home network. I don't want to talk about these because I don't think they're really relevant when you choose your modem, but it's uh, a reference if you want to navigate uh, the different components with the different technologies. So um, I think one key concept to understand um, in cellular connectivity is um, the signal multiplexing and which technology is using which. So uh, usually I take an, an example with a bar and uh, a bartender, but here I'm actually, uh, I found this uh, picture, which I know we have the IP because it's one of our pictures. It's, a, it's one of our team meetings where our scrum master moderates um, a meeting with the squad. And um, so you can imagine this, the, the scrum master here at the whiteboard, he's let's say, um, is like the antenna or the base station and needs to um, get all the information of the, um, of the team members, uh, the ones that are speaking and there are different procedures to do so. So, uh, one procedure which is used by 2G is time-based multiple um, uh, uh, time-based multiple access. So every person gets a different uh, time slot to speak. So that's let's say uh, more or less um, what we are what we be be using uh, as humans. Uh, very simple to understand. Um, there is a little bit of a trick. Uh, so there's of course also this is just a per uh, let's say transceiver specific so and an antenna can have multiple transceivers uh, so actually um, there is um, also some type of frequency um, uh, frequency uh, separation here but this is how um, gsm is working using time division multiple access um, code based cdma is um, different it is um, CDMA is also known um, as an own um, uh, technology type uh, which is deployed in Americas um, or has been uh, it's now more or less phased out uh, and you let's say to have an analogy uh, to CDMA it would be like every person in this group uh, speaks a different language and um, our scrum master would uh, be able to separate uh, these different 
languages just because they use a different schema and understand all people at the same time, even if they even if they speak at the same time, he would just distinguish them based on the code used. And uh, this technology is used by um, UMTS or White Band CDMA, um, uh, which 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 we know. And um, then there is also frequency uh, based. Um, multiple access and which is let's say every person uses a different pitch at a different uh, time so a little bit different frequency and as said this is fdma is used in all the technologies because the bands on which the phones talk are separated but um, uh, actually 4g and 5g in the current state they use ofdma which is let's say an advanced fdma where more more um, um, information can be transported because there's also uh, these um, frequencies have a specific time slot in which they're uh, which they're relevant um, here. One thing um, which is not much talked about, but if you look at modem specs, you often see this uh, FDD and TDD. Yeah, and um, so um, what does it mean, uh, duplex? Um, I know duplex first uh, from my printers. Yeah, if I have a duplex printer, then it can print on the forefront and the back front, um, uh, on the back. Um, and here it's, let's say duplex just means how does the device uh, send uplink yeah, to the uh, antenna and downlink? Yeah? How does is the signal separate it? And um, the most used uh, technology is here frequency-based uh, separation. So the device sends on a different frequency uplink than it does downlink. Yeah, and um, FDD is more or less used in all technologies. Um, and TDD, which is, you know, you send on the same frequency um, uplink, and then on the next, let's say, in the next period you send something downlink or uplink um, that is tdd and tdd i think there's um, let's say some corner cases already in 3g this that use tdd but it really has just uh, gained traction in 4g and um, will also play a role in 5g although there's coming a new concept and and that's full duplex um, which is uh, not yet available, but full duplex basically allows to send on the same frequency at the same time up and down link. Um, and with that, um, then of course, increases the bandwidth that's that's possible. And all this, you know, all this evolution is basically made possible by, let's say, the advances of um, radio frequency processing yeah? of all the electronic circuits that are possible um, and the processing power that, that we have right now, this advance has been made possible. And this is why, let's say, the cellular connectivity has advanced uh, within these four generations. So, okay, so this was, let's say, a little bit of a background, so how things uh, work. And now let's look into the questions I posed. So what is about coverage? Yeah. So um, let's say if you um, need to deploy a modem or a device somewhere, uh, I guess the best thing to do is what also consumers would do is look into, uh, let's say, uh, the network, the coverage maps of the mobile operator, if there's coverage or not. And then these coverage maps usually look like this, uh, which is very coarse. And uh, everyone knows in, in their own area, there are some areas uh, where, let's say, it's shown that there is coverage, but there is actually not coverage, um, especially if you think about indoor. So um, one thing to consider with the technologies is the frequency band on which um, they are deployed, because the frequency band has a direct impact on the coverage, yeah? on how far does the signal go from the tower to the device or, or vice versa. 
And um, when 2G uh, was deployed in, uh, in Europe, the 900 and 100, uh, 180 bands was, was used. And this provides a very nice um, coverage uh, from about 10 kilometers, just the pure signal. Yeah. So if you if you are let's say in an area without any obstacles, the the signal can travel 10 kilometers, which is quite far. And you see how let's say this uh, the 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 coverage really drops as the signal uh, the frequency increases. So with the advent of 3G, first the 1900 and 2100. Uh, frequency bands were standardized, um, but actually only deployed, let's say, in, in, in Europe, because in US or in Americas, uh, some of these bands were already used by um, GSM. So that's why, let's say, they were also um, using um, uh, other bands like the 900, 850 band in Americas to deploy 3, 3G. So this is kind of still straightforward. Where it becomes tricky is really if you look at 4G and 5G, um, we have, let's say, a different overview of the frequency bands on the next slide. But um, here it became more tricky because um, operators were really looking to deploy 4G in um, low bands as well because the lower the band, the higher the coverage. Um, and especially if you want to serve rural areas, you would use uh, a low frequency band and um, in, in high, high density um, urban areas, you would probably use a higher frequency band where there's less interference because not, there's not much, let's say, signal ongoing in, in these higher bands. So. 5G uh, is now, let's say, a different, uh, if different beast, or let's say, has different frequency bands that are targeted and are still being refined. There's, um, let's say, the traditional uh, cellular uh, bands like 600, 700, 800 um, that uh, uh, operators are trying to use to provide a large coverage, and these. Um, in these uh, frequency bands, they only have limited resources, so they can only get, let's say, 10 megahertz um, of these frequency bands, and that limits the, the bandwidth of of this um, uh, of these low band uh, 5G uh, deployments. So there's also the uh, idea to use mid bands, like around about 3.5 gigahertz and above, and also the high frequency bands, 26 to 40 gigahertz, which are called millimeter wave, where um, operators can, uh, let's say, use even 100 megahertz or 400 megahertz of a uh, frequency band, and with that really provide high throughput. But as you can see from the chart, these high wave, uh, high um, frequency waves, they have the disadvantage that, um, the coverage is poor, so um, so they the, the dimension of the cell will be very small. And uh, then there is another um, another concept to consider, which is about uh, indoor coverage. So if you want to deploy your device uh, indoor in a garage or in um, somewhere underground, uh, so in these difficult coverage situations it is again better to use low frequencies yeah and you let's say there's uh, nice graphs that show that uh, but are not let's say very intuitive so i thought um i just take the example if you have a neighbor uh with a band that plays uh one plays the drum and the other plays the flute you can be sure that you hear the drum right so the low frequencies um uh, which will let's say um, not be attenuated from from the wall, and with that you will um, receive low frequency signals better than 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 higher frequencies. 
So this can already give you some indication if you, let's say, expect millimeter wave, uh, really like 100 gigabits of throughput, uh, that this will not be possible indoors in case the antenna is outdoors. So um, I talked a little bit out about the band, and I have to admit the bands are, let's say, probably one of the most confusing things uh, if you look at cellular modems because they have, let's say, not intuitive naming. Yeah? You would somehow um, assume that the lowest band is 800 megahertz and that gets the lowest numerator B1, uh, but actually not. that's not the case. So the nomenclature is a little bit different. I think there's around 90 B bands uh, specified. Not all of them are used. Um, I tried really here to... Um, summarize the most relevant uh, B band. So I only excluded the ones that are not uh, used or which I just use by one carrier and one, one country. And you can see, uh, as I was showing also before, GSM is pretty straightforward. There are four frequency bands that are used around the world. UMTS has uh, five frequency bands and LTE has actually like 27 bands that are used. And it's a lot more difficult to find the right modem with the, with the right frequency bands. So in, in GSM, it was pretty straightforward. You could um, make a choice for, let's say, a little bit cheaper dual band GSM modem, which was either supported in North America or Americas, and um, or the other dual band modem, 900 and uh, 180, um, uh, frequency uh, which was serving uh, the rest of the world um, <clears throat> or uh, you know that's pretty common is you use a quad band so four band uh, modem which is um, B2, uh, 3, 5 and 8. Um, UMTS um, it's also, yeah, it's a little bit more tricky, but it follows somehow the, the same concept, um, except China and Japan, which have, let's say, some um, different uh, deployments. There you would need to look specifically, but um, usually with a, with a modem, with B1, 2, 4, 5, and 8, you would be well served and can basically serve all the all, all, um, countries. In LTE, it becomes more, more difficult. There's not a general recommendation. You would really need to look, where are my targeted countries, my targeted markets? What are the frequencies there? And um, I highly recommend here this uh, frequency website. Um, why not? Let's, uh, we're not uh, affiliated, although I, I kind of would love to. Uh, can I pull this down? Because it's um, just to give an impression, so you basically can look uh, into the band, and um, the tool is showing you in which net, uh, in which countries this um, band is deployed. So this gives you a good overview of um, of the utilization um, uh, of if you have a modem, um, where can I um, where can I get coverage with this modem? Okay, power consumption and cost. So if you buy a modem, um, there is, of course, you also need to dimension the, um, the form factor of the device, so battery uh, plays a role, um, and um, also the costs. And I think it's common sense, the more complex a system, the more it costs. So, um, so, Usually there's like this this um, uh, more complexity, more processing, more power and higher costs. And this is, let's say, what is happening throughout the generations, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G. And um, you can see the complexity here, let's say from just taking one example um, of the all the different frequency or signal processing that uh, has evolved uh, over this generation. So in GPS, there was, let's say, per wave, yeah, per um, period of a 
um, of, uh, of a radio wave, only two symbols were um, encoded. And now with um, 5G or new radio, up to 256 symbols are uh, encoded in one one period and one uh, wave. So that's uh, a lot of, um, let's say, intelligence and processing that needs to be done to, let's say, separate the different signals and, and make sense uh, sense out of this. And um, this has an impact on power. And I was trying to find really good measurements for this. It's it's really hard, yeah. Um, especially also uh, if you look at the narrowband IoT and LTM which are addressing this power consumption, there's really hard to find good um, uh, good reference um, literature. But I found here, let's say two ones, which I think I think uh, give a rough overview. You know, so uh, about the, let's say different um, power consumption of the different technologies. So um, from 2G to 3G you know, is about 50% or here 15 to 25 milliwatts difference in idle mode. And I think that's most relevant in IoT because most of the time the IoT device will be not sending or receiving data. So um, of course, if you have use cases that are sending a lot of data, um, and in very short periods, this idle mode may not be as relevant. And then the connection mode is more relevant. And uh, then um, then you need to look more into the power consumption for, let's say, how much power does it take to download a specific amount of data or upload a specific amount of data. And you can see, uh, not unexpected for 2G. If you download 100 megabytes, that's 10 kilojoule. For 3G, it's 3 kilojoule, just because the uh, download speed is higher, so the modem is not as long active. Yeah, it will consume during that time more um, current, but um, um, over uh, because it takes a shorter period of time, you, you're not spending so much power. And actually, I found this very interesting was also if you send an SMS over 2G, that's uh, actually less power than if you send it over 3G because at the end, <clears throat> the RF signal, so the radio frequency still needs to be decoded and uh, this gives a different, uh, different power consumption. So this is here actually almost 300% higher on 3G. This was a study done by, by Stanford. Um, yeah. And uh, so if you compare then 4G to 3G, it's somewhere, let's say, uh, in, in the same range. So you have about 50% more energy consumption in 4G and idle mode. And um, 3G consumes about 100% more if you um, uh, energy, if you look into the download per megabyte. And this is a study um, uh, done by the Columbia University. So from the cost side, I'm, let's say, taking already a little bit of the information that I want to present in the narrowband and cut M uh, section, but I think it makes sense to provide the, the different, um, uh, let's say, uh, different module types in one, one chart. This was a study I did, or let's say some research I did last year. Uh, so 2019, so maybe not super up to date, the, um, the, the numbers, but they should somehow indicate um, the prices here. What does a cellular modem cost for the different, um, for the different technologies? And you can see that the 2G modem is still the, the cheapest one, uh, also given, uh, of course, because it's the most uh, produced one. Um, and then you have uh, combined modems that have 3G and 2G, which are, uh, let's say, three times as high, and uh, LTE CAT4, which is, let's say, the normal LTE that we use uh, in smartphones, uh, that has then a different, um, different price range. Yeah. And you can see here these new technologies, narrowband, CAT M, um, and also CAT1, uh, which is another, uh, let's say, specific IoT or M2M 
technology has different uh, price tech. Yeah? So uh, a narrowband and CAT M1 um, uh, launched about two years ago. And the expectation is that actually the, the module prices will go down as more devices and um, um, adopt these, uh, the, this cellular type. And this is actually where we come to uh, LTM and narrowband IoT. And um, so, so the one question, yeah, why is traditional cellular connectivity inefficient for IoT? Yeah, so uh, why is it actually uh, using so much power? And um, it's pretty simple, um, you know, or let's say in put, uh, if we put it in simple terms, um, it's uh, cellular connectivity was never designed for IoT where let's say the data transfer is uplink, yeah, where um, the device sends data to the application to the cloud and there the data is processed. It was for conversational voice. Yeah? So um, it's like here, um, Margie uh, waiting in front of the phone and always listening, is there a call for me? Yeah? So every device was constantly um, decoding all the RF signals, um, even if there was no call um, and was also always um, announcing where is the handset located. So in case there was a call for um, the, the smartphone or for, for the handset, then uh, the tower or let's say the mobile core network would know where to send this call. And so you always had this, um, let's say, power consumption where the device was sending, I'm here, I'm located now in, um, um, in this specific area, and then was constantly listening um, if there is a call coming in for me. And again, sending up the location and listening if there's a, is there if there's a call a page uh, paging call for me? So this uh, power consumption can add up over time, and if you want to minimize the power, you have to look into LTM and narrowband IoT, which uh, have some specific features to address this: less power, um, improved coverage, cheaper device costs, and smaller form factor are the four, let's say, pillars of LTM and narrowband and um, their specific features launched um, within these cellular types that address this. I don't have enough time to go through all of them. I see already we're um, pretty uh, advanced in time here in the webinar. So just give me, let's say, a rough overview of the features which are relevant and um, how, what's the current state here. Yeah, so. One um, feature which is very relevant is the power save mode. So you can see here again, the, let's say the energy pattern and the power save mode is just basically allowing the device to go to sleep without signaling where, where it's at. Um, and with that, it's not able to, let's say, get data but uh, in most cases, this is irrelevant for IoT use cases. So then the device just wakes up itself and sends data. Yeah, and this power safe mode can be activated for long periods of time. So the device is asleep and does not use any power. This actually was already specified for CAT1, uh, which is like, um, I think I shortly said, LTE CAT1 is uh, the first M2M IoT cellular connectivity technology. So there are modules in the market that are uh, providing 10 megabits download and five megabits upload, which are these CAT1 devices. They're a little bit cheaper um, and have, have also the possibility to use this power save mode. Not all of the modems support it, but some. So you may watch in, into this. LTM and narrowband IoT both support this, but the network, yeah, so there's, let's say, some configurations that you can do on the power save mode, dynamically setting the period. This is not necessarily supported by all the networks, so it's really up to the network where 
where the device is located if all the power save mode uh, functionality is available. EDRX, extended discontinuous reception cycle, I think uh, is the uh, acronym for that, is um, let's say the period um, between the uh, times where I'm listening if a call comes in to, for me. And so with this EDRX, I can extend this time and with that basically improve my power usage and this is uh, available for LTM and narrowband, not for CAT1. And same state as for PSM, it's partially supported by, by the network. Enhanced coverage is another functionality, which basically, I have no picture for this, but let's say to speak in simple words, their um, LTM and narrowband, they have functionalities to resend data. Yeah? So um, if the device is in, um, challenging coverage uh, situation, the device can try more and more to send the data multiple times. And with that, there's a higher chance that the data comes through even in, in uh, difficult coverage situations. Then there's a small difference here, LTM and narrowband IoT. Narrowband IoT has a new power class, or both have the 20 dB power class, which is, let's say, um, using less power to send data. Narrowband IoT has also the 14 dB power class. But also what does it mean? You have to also understand that if you have the new power class with 14 dB, of course, then the coverage will be smaller than with a 20 dB power class. So this is really something to consider more in, uh, in, in, in challenging. You would always go to 20 dB. And then there is this control plane, um, cellular IoT EPS. So it's basically allowing you to send data over the control plane, which is also improving the, um, uh, the, the power consumption, which is available for narrowband IoT and is, let's say, questionable or in standardization for LTM and, and, and cut one. So current state uh, for LTM and narrowband IoT. Um, so according to GSMA, uh, there's a website uh, which lists all the uh, networks that, ha that, let's say, announced uh, to GSMA that they have launched LTM and narrowband. Um, there are 36 uh, networks with LTM and 93 with narrowband IoT. But... Um, Based on our testing and our talks to our Romain partners, we see that there are a lot of networks missing. We actually have coverage, um, LTM coverage in networks uh, which are not on this list. So if you, let's say, uh, have a specific request for a specific country, best thing is to try it out or uh, check, uh, check with um, a cellular connectivity provider if there is LTM coverage in, in that uh, network. Um, the state currently for narrowband IoT um, is that there's no roaming. So you always, if you get a SIM card from one connectivity provider, you are basically uh, limited to the footprint of this connectivity provider as to one network. Um, whereas for LTM roaming is possible. Now the first, let's say, uh, roaming agreements specifically for LTM have been uh, issued and um, that allows to not only do um, roaming in different countries, but it also allows to roam in the same country. So national roaming, which means in case you have with uh, one operator in the country, no coverage for LTM, but another operator has their coverage, then you, then you can use the LTM. Nice thing about the modems uh, for LTM and narrowband is that they really have the wide range of supported bands. So there are really a lot of global versions available um, compared to LTE modems where you always have to, let's say, cherry pick the modem based on your deployment. Um, this is a tremendous um, simplification for device manufacturers because they can use one modem for shipping the device um, globally. Um, the LTM and narrowband IoT deployments are usually uh, quite incomplete. Um, that means not 
you know, if, even if I'm highlighting here specific uh, countries, it doesn't mean that there's um, coverage from LTM and narrowband everywhere. There are whole specific uh, ENOBs that have not been updated. So we see a lot of 2G fallback. So our customers, so we have, just to give you an idea, there we have 30 plus modules uh, for LTM and narrowband IoT in our network. And 50% of these modules are using LTM, whereas 85% are using 2G because they are deployed in non-LTM countries. And um, the, the reasoning is pretty simple. The um, device manufacturer just wanted to make sure to be already um, future-proof with, uh, with the new technology while still having um, the possibility to fall back to 2G to make sure the device really works wherever the device is shipped. Okay, so two slides for, for 5G and I think then we're um, at the top of the hour. Um, just very high level on uh, 5G. What is, which concepts does 5G bring? So uh, 5G has three main targets. And uh, one is enhanced mobile broadband, which is, I guess, less relevant for IoT use cases. It's more um, for uh, providing really high bandwidth with this high frequency bands I was talking about in the beginning, where full duplex is uh, relevant and these um, high amount of symbols that can be transported over a period. And also things like carrier aggregation, where the device connects to multiple cells or frequencies uh, to get uh, more bandwidth. Usually these uh, modems are quite expensive um, and uh, serve, uh, let's say, uh, the, the smartphone, the um, DSL um, or broadband uh, market. And then there are two goals um, for machine type communication, so for IoT. This is the URL CC, ultra reliable latency um, uh, communication, um, which is also called CMTC, so critical MTC. And um, this is specifically designed for car-to-car uh, -car communication and um, industry automation where there is a high demand for reliable uh, communication and also for latency. Yeah? And um, there are concepts um, that uh, allow the um, device and the antenna to quicker send data. So in uh, LTE, for example, there's this, let's say, radio uh, scheduling. So when let's say the antenna needs to send a, 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 um, some package or some some data, it, uh, the the resource needs to be scheduled, and these frames are one millisecond uh, in width, uh, whereas in 5G it's um, uh, planned to have 0 .0, uh, um, 0.125 milliseconds, uh, and with let's say or even with a larger uh, bandwidth, yeah? so very flexible adjustment of the radio resource uh, to to the demand, and also uh, ultra reliable um, uh, communication, for example, with data duplication. And uh, it's common sense if I have here duplication and these, let's say, different requirements, then I'm probably not going to get these uh, 100 gigabits of throughput. This is going to be less um, throughput but therefore higher, um, better latency and, and super reliable. And then there is a massive machine type communication um, as a target. So this is many devices, low cost. And actually in the first release of 5G, this was more or less disregarded because narrowband and IoT, uh, narrowband IoT and LTM was filling these gaps. Um, so all the advances that you see here in M, uh, in narrowband IoT and LTM are actually addressing these needs. And it is um, foreseen that these uh, narrowband IoT and LTM advances will 
uh, continue first on the LTE, but uh, on the LTA technology, but also merged into 5G. So what's the current state of 5G? And I think that's um, a last slide before the summary is um, from, let's say, modem choice, it will be even more complex than LTE. You have the uh, different frequency bands, low, mid, high, and the different use cases that are addressed. Um, so different pi uh, price points, um, uh, different deployments that are possible. Um, so um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to see how this evolves over time. Uh, the first 5G networks are deployed. Um, you see here 73 operators in 41 countries have limited deployments. Um, we are kind of lucky, um, our, our office, okay, I haven't been in the office for a while, but um, actually it's in the Deutsche Telekom footprint of a 5G uh, trial, so there's possible to get um, 5G connectivity, but it is actually not, let's say, the full um, full blown 5G, because most of the deployments are in non standalone mode. That means that only the radio is using 5G technology, uh, but the core network is still LTE. So there are some advances that are possible in this non standalone mode, but um, let's say all the functionality is um, only possible in the standalone mode. Um, and this is, I think, the, the main takeaway uh, for 5G is you have to understand that the 5G is really still evolving. So every year, um, every actually every quarter, new functionality is specified and uh, will be released. And the industry or the modem manufacturers, the network manufacturers, they all need to adopt these new standards and um, they will evolve and adapt. So all the um, new functionality will be, um, let's say, there will be not be a break. So the, the functionality that you get today will always be available also in the future, but um, you might be missing functionality that you want to have later on. And if you want to, let's say, really look into um, testing 5G, there are some first modules available. So you can, you could test in these um, limited deployments. Uh, so um, some vendors have some available, but they're quite costly. Really, this, this is more for testing. Their device costs around $500, uh, just the modem. And um, really for production ro rollout, this I see currently is not, um, not relevant. Also, there's a lot about hype about this millimeter wave, 26 to 40 gigahertz. I actually see only limited use cases in this area because it really addresses these high bandwidth use cases um, where I see 85% of the use cases more on the low, low, low bands, um, which, which uh, aim for coverage and uh, reliable connection. Um, Narrowband and IoT and LTM will merge with 5G and with the 5G core, there will be some interlinking. So uh, narrowband, and I, uh, narrowband IoT and LTM are future proof. Um, so there's not a gap if you choose this as your connectivity type that this will be obsolete with, with 5G. And um, there's also another thing to consider um, uh, so with LTE, actually, I was already starting, let's say, the specification or the, um, uh, the advances for private networks so that um, uh, industries could roll out their own LTE network. Uh, and 5G, uh, there is the same concept available, and there have been frequency bands assigned to, to these private networks uh, to build up um, an own network. But this is also still in the making. Uh, there are some tests, but uh, not really uh, wide deployments here. Yes, and this is basically a summary uh, of what I've discussed. Um, just maybe GSM is probably still the most far used technology. We see still more than 50% of the traffic on GSM. LTM is really gaining traction. 
because it provides a good balance between bandwidth cost and battery consumption and because of its roaming capability. Um, UMTS is kind of, um, let's say, stuck in the middle uh, between 2G and LTE and LTM. Um, it's really just dependent on where you deploy, if uh, their GSM is not available or if you need to, to have specific um, download requirements during UMTS is relevant. Um, narrowband IoT is really um, catching up. It has been actually invented by Huawei and this is why it has large deployments in Europe and in, in Asia Pacific and will have um, in the coming years a, a, a large, um, large footprint. But currently this roaming is holding a little bit back the deployment because it makes it more difficult to deploy the devices. Um, Curves, let's say from my opinion, 5G, 5G is currently not a viable option. Um, there's really few modems, low coverage and high costs. Um, but um, I think it's really um, uh, keeping uh, an eye on the advances of 5G um, can, can help to understand what use cases might be possible also in my industry if I adopt to 5G um, uh, within the coming years. Okay, hey, for all you have um, uh, stayed uh, in the webinar for for this hour, I hope you enjoyed it. I see there's a lot of questions. Um, I, um, I apologize to, for overrunning a little bit, um, but I still want to answer the questions. Um, after um, the webinar, we will of course um, share the recording and, and the slides and also a little bit summary about what I discussed. Um, uh, you will get this via via email with the link. Okay, so one question. Your 5G is going to have an issue with coverage as the propagation from the tower is going to be more limited, even more than LTE is now. If this is the case, will the IoT devices be able, able to readily access that kind of network or will the device need to be modified to attach to the network better? I'm not 100% uh, sure if I understand the, the question correctly, um, but um, in these uh, millimeter wave frequency bands. Yes, yeah? so I think this goes into the coverage conversation that we had. It's going to be uh, more challenging yeah? so uh, that the um, that the device stays attached to 5G, but actually the standardization take care of this. So there are um, uh, mechanisms like beam forming that try to, let's say, um, um, uh, structure the beam or the, the, the signal in a way that uh, it is um, focused on a specific um, device or subscriber and with that this subscriber gets a, a seamless coverage. It's definitely more challenging to have wide coverage of these uh, high frequency um, uh, stations so that because they have limited coverage this is really dependent on the rollout of the operators. I'm really looking forward how our 5G network will look in, let's say, two years to see how patchy is it is and how um, how relevant still the legacy technologies will be. So, if the device needs to be modified to attach to the network better, um, I think a lot of the let's say logic the modems usually take care of. Um, so the modern manufacturers, they make sure that the technology um, that is available is used. You can set specific preferences, um, but let's say for for um, um, tweaking, I expect maybe in the early beginning that there are, let's say, some uncertainties or regional differences where it makes sense to do some tweaks, but over time this will be incorporated in the modems. Do you have any presence in India? If so, any through any channel partner? So we have um, a global sales team, but we're um, we don't have a specific one for 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 India. Uh, but feel free to reach out. Um, we're happy to support you. We have a couple of customers in India, so so we are familiar with the situation. 
where can I find the presentation? A set uh, I will share later on. Is China still using the TDD mode for LTE? I'm not 100%. So from what the information that I found, yes. Uh, there are some some bands actually still used by uh, specific carriers, and um, um, that uh, that is uh, at least from the information I have, that is still the case. But hello, is uh, 4G narrowband IoT LTM compatible with 5G narrowband IoT LTM? I think I got, got a little bit into this. Uh, so um, the standardization foresees this. Yeah, so uh, that basically all the um, functionality that if you buy buy now a 4G narrowband IoT LTM modem, that um, this will still be available with the 5G one. Yeah, so it will interoperate with the 5G core network and um, uh, the advance will not be, be lost. Is 5G safe when user using higher frequencies? I don't know what safe means. Um, uh, higher frequency, the, the nice thing about it from a safe point of view, if you want to say so, is that let's say the higher frequencies are less used. So there's not much interference from other signals. And with that, uh, the, um, there are less errors um, on uh, expected on these frequencies. What about device certification? Is it necessary to get pc B or operator, for instance, with at and certification or who should be concerned with this? This is manufacturers only. Uh, very good question. I, I kind of put this out of the, let's say, questions here, um, out of this presentation. So I, we probably have a separate session on device certification in general. Uh, US have this, uh, the US or Americas have this PCTRB uh, certification, uh, which is, let's say, the more complex the technology, uh, the more complex, of course, the certification. But actually, the motor manufacturers take a lot of the necessities away. Um, then you have these um, operator-specific certifications. Uh, these need to be concluded if you want to sell your device through AT&T, for example. Uh, but if you have a roaming SIM, then this is uh, not necessary. With 5G, is the best for smart which technology is the best for smart meter implementation? Implementation. I mean between these three technologies: narrowband LTM, weightless, or weightless. Yeah. So there are on on this um, webinar. I concentrated on the cellular um, um, connectivity types. There are also another like weightless or LoRa or Sigfox, uh, low power uh, alternatives that are usually in conjunction with um, cellular uh, types where basically there are, um, let's say in, in local areas like in um, an apartment house or in an industry, you have these smart meters sending to a central gateway and then from the central gateway, uh, the device is transported over cellular to um, to the infrastructure or to the application. Um, I'm I have to admit I'm I'm a huge fan of cellular because I'm coming from this uh, domain. I see that um, LoRa or um, other technologies have challenges with the coverage, whereas let's say um, cellular connectivity is uh, worldwide available, and I don't need to consider deploying my own gateway or or, or or any hardware, I just use use the um, the connectivity as a service. I pay my my fee, which I can also let's say easily communicate to my customers, and um, uh, fits in many of the service models that we see. On the overall, the main difference from the functionality point of view between LTM and narrowband IT is the roaming. It seems to me that LTM will still be beating 5G in the next three years time. What do you think? Please consider the IoT tech market. A uh, very good summary, actually. Yeah. So this is ex exactly what I see um, for for IoT. Um, 
LTM and narrowband IoT are the technologies that are new. Uh, 2G has still its footprint, uh, still its relevance, um, because LTM and narrowband IoT are not um, as widely available. And 5G actually has, let's say, first focused on this EMMB, so enhanced mobile broadband and this um, um, low latency use cases and everything for IoT tech is all the advance is in these two technologies. Okay, so we are we're now at the end of the questions and thank you all for staying uh, this long in, in the webinar. I'm interested in also learning what would be, um, let's say, topics you are interested. Um, so you can uh, connect uh, on LinkedIn with me. My name is Christian Henke uh, with Emnify. And um, just um, if you're interested about the chat or just um, want to learn something new, let me know and maybe we can we can do another webinar on this. Okay, thanks a lot and um, see you soon. Bye.